Hello, history students, and welcome back to our discussion of World War II. So recently, we've been taking a look at the rise of totalitarian dictators uh, in Germany, of course, also in Italy and the USSR. And now today, we're going to take a look at the ways in which the systems that they've built and the military, militarized states that they have created are going to lead us into a war that is the most destructive war in human history and is going to kill perhaps as many as 75 million people across the globe. And if we take a look at this first slide, this is a picture that uh, 20 years ago, no one really would have expected could have happened. Uh, during w the course of World War I, um, the, the allies with Great Britain and France, and then of course later the Americans, were able to not only hold off the German attack, um, but also be able to push them back and, and really fight this thing to a stalemate uh, before the war finally does end with Germany as the loser. And here they are marching with their Wehrmacht units or their army units through the Arc de Triomphe, the symbol of French victories throughout their history built originally by Napoleon Bonaparte. And so again, no one would have expected this to happen, but especially not so quickly. And how did Hitler and the Nazis do it? Well, it's a number of different factors here that we'll take a look at today. And uh, it all begins really with appeasement. Appeasement is a time period in European history that you can see starts in 1936 and goes until 1939 when the war actually begins in September of 1939. And appeasement basically means to make someone happy, to try and keep them from becoming violent or antagonistic by appealing to what they want or giving them what they want. And so it's, it's kind of like bribing them to stop from any kind of violence. So Germany started to rapidly rearm in the post-1936 time period. And the reason for that was because Germany uh, was facing the Great Depression and one of the ways in which Hitler planned to deal with that Great Depression was to put men back to work in factories and building projects, similar to the New Deal. But in this case, the New Deal was focusing on infrastructure in America, building bridges, building parks, you name it. Um, but the uh, Germans, they're going to focus upon building things like the Audubon Speedway, and building Volkswagens and you know those kinds of things but at the same time also focusing very heavily upon putting men back to work in building arms and uh, weapons of destruction and uh, this is going to make it so that Germany had one of the best and most prepared militaries in the world and in which totally violates the Treaty of Versailles you might recall that the Treaty of Versailles said that Germany is not allowed to have a Luftwaffe not allowed to have any kind of air force they're not allowed to have have panzer divisions or tank divisions. They're not allowed to have any kind of military but beyond a defensive force, which was 100,000 men. And now here they are building up their military machine. Hitler is going to begin that with his Luftwaffe. So another, ger it's a German term that you need to know, Luft meaning air and then Waffe meaning weapon, so air weapon or air force. And the Luftwaffe was the best air force in the entire world. It wasn't the largest, but it was the most technologically advanced and is going to greatly help the Germans in World War II. You see, the French, they had plenty of planes. The British had plenty of planes, but they used their plane technology as a method of what you'd call reconnaissance. So they would like use them to spy on enemies, but not use them to bomb strategic points or to dogfight in the air or anything like that. The Germans will focus upon bombing and dogfighting and uh, beyond just the simple um, uh, uh, reconnaissance type of flights. Now, uh, Hitler was so proud of his creation because this is a specifically Nazi creation. It wasn't something that was created by the original German army that existed before Hitler. So Hitler takes great pride in his Luftwaffe. He actually invited uh, the pilot of the time period. And of course, you know him. He's the man that flew the Spirit of St. Louis from uh, New York to Paris. And um, he is a world famous, well, the most world famous pilot at this time. And that, of course, is Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, while he's an American citizen, was culturally German. And he's also what you'd consider consider an Aryan. He was also a bit of a racist. I hate to throw the man under the bus or the plane, but uh, he was not a big fan of, he's a bit of an anti-Semite, okay, and a bit of a, a man of the time period, kind of like Tom Buchanan in the novel uh, The Great Gatsby. So um, Charles Lindbergh was personally invited by Adolf Hitler to go to Germany and get a tour with the Fuhrer and with the various air marshals like Hermann Goering uh, to walk around the Luftwaffe and they're like, yeah, take a look at this plan. Oh, and this is Luftwaffe. How, how wunderbar. Yeah. And Hitler was just gushing over Charles Lindbergh and actually asked him if, if Lindbergh would consider 
coming to Germany to become the lead general or one of the lead generals of the German Luftwaffe. And thankfully, Lindbergh was like, oh, no, no, thank you very much. I got to go home. So he goes back home to the United States and he immediately made an appointment with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He said, Mr. President, we are in big trouble if we have a war with Germany because they've got an air force that is far better than anything we've ever created. And so he warned the president, we need to be prepared. Good thing he did, because over the next four years, the United States is going to quietly be producing planes that are similar with the technology, because we know we could be in trouble if we don't. All right, the next thing that's spelling trouble here for the international community is the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht is the German army, and the Wehrmacht until uh, or after World War I had 100,000 men uh, that they were legally allowed to have. Now, Hitler had been um, uh, wanting to quietly build up this military machine and he knows that he has to expand the Wehrmacht but if he does that's going to be a hot button issue that'll get him in a lot of trouble with France and possibly provoke a war and there's this issue that that comes up where if the Allies if, if Great Britain and France had done something to stop Hitler in these early phases of 1936 if they had just made enough noise about this hit this uh, dictators moves there's a good chance that um, the the lead member members of the Wehrmacht who didn't like Hitler could have overthrown him early in 1936 or 37. This is what's so troubling about appeasement is that because the Allies did nothing to stop him, I mean, in part, it's a good thing because it gave the Allies more time to prepare for a future war, but at the same time, it also made it so that it guaranteed Hitler's success. The next thing that Hitler is going to build up and make incredibly technologically advanced as well are the Panzer tanks. Now, Panzer tanks are smaller, more mobile tanks. They also have radio technology so that they can communicate back and forth. They've, uh, they're a much smaller uh, tank, which allows them to go faster and also have greater distance before they need to refuel. So these tanks really are mobile, they're fast, they communicate well um, between their squadrons, whereas it's very different from, say, what the French had at this time, or the British. See, the British and the French at this time were using these massive lumbering tanks, these huge things that were super slow. They didn't go more than about 11 miles per hour. They also couldn't go very far before they had to refuel, and then they'd just sit there and wait for the fuel people to show up and fill them up. And so the purpose of tanks for the French and the Brits was that they would use them as a method of having their men run behind the tank. So here's the tank, right? And then here's the little men and the tank's going along and we're running behind it as guys are shooting from this angle. That's the, the purpose of tanks for the Brits and the French. And the reason I emphasize that is because it's incredibly important to the way in which Germany ends up winning in the West in the first couple of years of war because they use tanks as individual little squadrons of, they called them wolf packs. They would go out together and surround around the enemy and just leave the infantry behind. Who cares about those guys? And that was what made them, one of the many things that made them so dang effective is their speed. Really, the result for Germany is that while they were the uh, country that was hit the hardest by the Great Depression with the most unemployment before Hitler came to power, they're the first to exit from the Great Depression because, in part, of the things that, uh, that Hitler is doing to put Germany back on the move. So appeasement is going to make it so that Hitler is not only reinvigorating Germany and putting them back on the move and gaining some of their military power back, but also he wants to retake lands that had been lost in World War I, again in violation of the treaty obligations put forth in the Treaty of Versailles. Now there are two main personalities here that are associated with appeasement. One who is in favor of appeasement because he wants to avoid another war that would kill tens of millions of people like World War I had. And then there's another one that is totally opposed to appeasement because he knows that Hitler is a dictator, knows that he's a man that spells trouble, and wants to resist him at all costs. So the first personality is Neville Chamberlain. Neville Chamberlain was the Prime Minister of Great Britain um, in 1936, and he will be in that position until 1940. Neville Chamberlain had seen what happened in World War One. He was a politician during that time in Parliament, and he wanted at all costs to avoid another war. So he is willing to to essentially let Hitler take 
you know, the occasional cookie from the cookie jar. Keep doing this or that little thing to uh, get a little bit of pride back, maybe take a little territory here and there, maybe get his army back on the move, because he does not think that a war is worth it. And most of public opinion in Great Britain at this time agreed. Now, France, meanwhile, is very upset about what's going on. They keep talking to Great Britain saying, are you going to help us if there's a war? I mean, we want your help here. We want an alliance. We want to stick it to Hitler. And um, Great Britain under Neville Chamberlain's just stepping back, saying, well, it's, it's just not worth a war for us right now. Now, Winston Churchill, they're going to nickname him the Bulldog, justifiably. Winston Churchill, the cigar-smoking, whiskey-drinking, uh, beautiful man that he will become throughout this time period, is, uh, is, is trying to get Parliament and all of England to realize that Hitler is a bad man that will do terrible things to the world. But unfortunately, he's seen as a radical right now, and he's seen as being full of bombast. Bombast means he's just kind of blustering and, and angry, trying to start a war. He's seen as a jingoist, really. And so Chamberlain right now has the authority. Hitler is going to start his process with a little thing called the invasion of the Rhineland. So you can see here on the map, this is the Rhineland right here. This is a demilitarized region of Germany. So it belongs to the Germans. It is culturally German. It's their land and everything. But after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Great Britain and France said that they were not allowed to have any kind of military presence there. And then when Germany defaulted on their loans, they were unable to pay their war, loan, war debt loans to the Allies, uh, both Great Britain, France, and then also Belgium occupied that territory as a collateral for the debt that was owed. So Hitler doesn't like that. It makes him look bad politically too for the allies to be sitting there. So what he does is after building up the Wehrmacht and expanding them to over 2 million men strong, having the Luftwaffe to back them up and panzer divisions right there in front of them as well, Hitler is going to boldly send his men into the Rhineland and the military was sweating right now. They thought there was going to be a war. They were not feeling prepared for a war and they thought for sure they would lose. So they're sweating bullets here, right? Pun intended. As they cross into the Rhineland thinking, if this fails, we overthrow Hitler, the politician. Doesn't fail. In fact, the Brits, the French, and the Belgians all, with, all withdraw from the Rhineland and from the, the, uh, the border with the Rhineland because they don't want a war either. So Hitler is strengthened by this move and therefore is ready to take that next step. The next step will take place in 1938 and it's called the Anschluss. All right, Austria is right here and it's a new country after World War I because the Austro-Hungarian Empire used to be all of this stuff right here and that as well. But it's going to get changed into Austria, right there, the little purple glob, and Austria is culturally German. They speak German, they feel German, uh, right? So uh, Hitler is basically going along with this nationalistic idea that helped bring him to power called Pan-Germanism, meaning all Germans need to be unified in one country. And so he says uh, to Austria, uh, we want to take you over. And the Austrian prime minister said no. So what did the Nazis do? There were some Austrian Nazis that, um, that killed him, and then they invited Germany to annex Austria. And so Anschluss means the unity or uh, annexation between Germany and Austria. So the Anschluss is the unifying of Germany to Austria, therefore greatly expanding the German Empire as well, or the German Reich that Hitler is trying to build under the Third Reich. Now, the Munich Conference is the next major hurdle that Hitler has got, and that Neville Chamberlain will be presented with at this point. Because um, here we have this area called the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is cultural Culturally German, and after World War I, the Allies thought it necessary to help protect the new country of Czechoslovakia by giving them some very defensible and industrialized areas known as the Sudetenland. Now, because it is culturally German, they're taking that territory away from the Germans themselves, and Hitler again, pissed about that, as were most nationalistic Germans. They wanted the territory back, and the Czechs said, no, we're not going to give it to you. And so the Czechs were ready to fight a war to protect this territory. They saw what was coming. They knew if Hitler takes the Sudetenland, next it's going to be to take all of Czechoslovakia. They know that. And ironically, remember that World War I was fought to um, protect democracy in order to build democracies in Eastern Europe and protect democracy. All of these territories out here in Eastern Europe that have been created as democracies, not one of them exists anymore. The only country that is still a democracy by 1938 is Czechoslovakia. I mean, that's the one worth fighting for, really. The rest have become dictatorships, not democracies. And Czechoslovakia has an alliance with Great Britain. 
a military alliance. So they appealed to Neville, Neville Chamberlain in Great Britain and said, we are ready to fight if you are ready, ready to back us in the coming conflict to protect our territories. And so Hitler is going to be talking to his ally, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini is actually going to request, why don't we all just sit down and talk about this and we'll meet in Bavaria, which is southern Germany, right down here. We'll meet in Bavaria and we'll meet in a city called Munich. Munich is a very strong uh, Hitler supporting area. It's where he got started with all of his Nazi ideas and uh, his Nazi movements, including the Beer Hall Pusht. And so he said, uh, let's, uh, so Hitler and Mussolini are going to invite uh, the Allies to meet in Munich, and they will do so in 1938. So Neville Chamberlain will be there, the President of France will be there as well, Benito Mussolini will be there. Guess who's not invited? Czechoslovakia. They were not invited to discuss their own fate, but the other great powers sit down and talk about it. And what they will decide is, Hitler, you're allowed to take the Sudetenland, but that's it. No more cookies out of the cookie jar. No more appeasement for you, Hitler. And Hitler says, absolutely, yavol, yavol. And so he says, uh, I, I won't take any more. Well, the Allies go away. Everyone thinks it's a victory. Neville Chamberlain flies back home, and people are heralding him as a hero. Uh, everyone is saying, the man that promotes peace and saved our world from another world war. And then three weeks later, Adolf Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia with his tanks and his Wehrmacht and his Luftwaffe. So the Czechs are sending telegrams to the Brits saying, we are ready to fight if you are ready to join us. And their guns are primed and ready. And the Brits totally sold them out. And they said, put your guns down. We're not coming to help you. So at that point, uh, the war is avoided because Britain considers this not worth a war for them. So Hitler successfully takes Czechoslovakia without firing a single shot. And you notice he did that in these other countries as well, but the Czechs, that's where the war could have started. And again, hindsight bias here. Had the Allies taken to the offensive here and maybe attacked Germany while they were still a bit weaker, it would have dramatically changed the course of the war because there's a good chance either that Hitler could have been overthrown after this or that uh, they that Germany could have lost the war because they were not as militarily prepared as they will be a year and even two years after that when the war really gets going. So the Munich Conference is seen as a big stain on British history because they sold them out. But next, Hitler is making noise over what's called the Polish corridor. The Polish corridor is right here. All right, this, uh, you know, might notice that Germany has been divided into two chunks, right? And the reason for that is because Poland is a new country and they didn't want Poland to be landlocked. So there's this port city called Danzig right there. And the port city of Danzig was given to the Poles as a method of helping them to have access to the North Sea. Well, Hitler for years has been making noise about wanting the Polish corridor back. And I mean, honestly, he's got some legitimate cause to be upset here because that is German territory. It always has been, but it was taken away from them in this war that was not meant to take away territory from anyone. It's hypocrisy, but still. So uh, Hitler is pledging he will take that and he will fight for it if necessary. So Hitler is thinking that the Allies aren't going to do anything to stop him. He thinks it'll be just like before where they make a bunch of blustering claims like, oh, you can't do that. And then he goes and does it and no one says anything and there's no war. Uh, he's in fact telling his generals, there will not be a war over this. They will not fight for Polish corridor. Everything will be fine. And so Hitler makes his plans accordingly. And meanwhile, the Brits are looking at Neville Chamberlain like a weakling at this point. And they're liking the voice of Winston Churchill, who is saying that if Poland is taken, we will fight a war against you. And so Hitler starts to listen to that. He starts to realize that the Brits are, are ready to fight a war. So what he does is he tries to avoid a two-front war. Now, you might recall that in World War I, when Germany foolhardily planned the Schlieffen Plan with a two-front war in order to uh, take out the French while they hold off the Russians, uh, that didn't go so well and ended up causing them to lose. Okay, if they just focused on one over the other, they would have won more than likely. So Hitler's looking at this situation and says, you know what I need to do? I need to make a deal with my number one enemy, Joseph Stalin. So he proposes what's called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Mutual Non-Aggression Pact. Did you get that? Ribbentrop-Molotov Mutual Non-Aggression Pact, also known as the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. He is going to meet with Joseph Stalin or send his ministers to meet with Joseph Stalin and his ministers and tell him that even though we hate each other, even though I always talk about how much we need to kill you and you're the enemy of the German people, we need to make a deal so that there's no chance that we're going to go to war together. Essentially what he plans is we're going to divide Poland in half. Germany gets this half and then Soviet Union gets that half and everybody wins. Everybody's happy. 
except the Poles, of course. So that's his method of avoiding a, uh, pro provoking a war with Joseph Stalin. And it's going to work brilliantly because Hitler will, and Stalin will sign this mutual non-aggression pact exactly one week before the invasion of Poland, September the 1st, 1939, and the start of World War II. Now, there's been a lot of criticism over the years from historians and you know newspapers and you name it about uh, whether or not these, these people that appeased Hitler are a bunch of spineless democracies, a bunch of weaklings that uh, don't know how to stand up to this dictator. You know, Winston Churchill, for instance, calling people like Neville Chamberlain a spineless Democrat. And uh, you know, maybe that's not fair. Uh, as we take a look at some of the uh, publications of the time period, there's certainly going to be a lot of people speaking against it, but some that are in favor of this appeasement as well. Um, for instance, when Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister, was on his way to the Munich Conference, uh, you can see the Daily Sketch calling him the man the world looks to. They wanted a peace. They didn't think that Czechoslovakia was worth the deaths of tens of millions of people and the death of another lost generation. And so, many people supporting Neville Chamberlain hoping this will go well. But then you've got Dr. Seuss. Okay, Dr. Seuss in the 1930s and 40s was actually a political cartoonist and he was a fist pumping anti-Nazi. Hated Hitler and the Nazis. And here he is giving us a cartoon called The Appeaser. You can see the appeaser playing the violin for the Nazi and uh, hoping he won't get consumed. And then here we've got uh, the, um, the lollipops, right? And so remember one more lollipop and then you all go home. Hmm. Tell the Nazi Hydra to leave him alone. The appeaser is about to get consumed there as well. Thank you, Dr. Seuss. Here we have uh, another cartoon talking about the spineless leaders of democracy. Okay, you've got Hitler goose-stepping and playing his nose flute at everyone, first with rearmament, then with the Anschluss and the Sudetenland, and then taking the Polish corridor with the port city of Danzig, and then what? Well, how about global domination is what's next here for Adolf Hitler. I mean, they're accurately calling this thing, aren't they? Here we can see the former allies of the French and British family, the ex-French British family right here. You can see all these countries that are about to get consumed by Adolf Hitler, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. And now they're coming into Deutschland über alles. And so that means um, long live Germany. That's their national anthem. And he's saying, come on. He's like a little Pied Piper, right? I don't know if you know this, but uh, the Pied Piper uh, was actually a serial killer in the medieval time period who whisked children away with his flute and promises of candy and edibles and whatnot, took them to the forest, skinned them alive, and then hung their skins and their faces from tree branches. That's essentially what Hitler has become as a modern Pied Piper for the allies of Europe. Mm. All right, and then here we've got Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, two men that have been sworn enemies and hate each other, uh, tipping their hats to one another. And you can see Hitler saying, the scum of the earth, I believe. And then Stalin replying, the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. Hmm. And then we've got Poland dead and crucified to the floor of the hell that we are about to in encounter. It's kind of ironic because Joseph Stalin in the mid-1930s actually sent a number of diplomatic requests to England, France, and the United States, uh, promising that this will get bad. I mean, he knows that Hitler plans a war against uh, the USSR. How does he know that? Well, he, Hitler wrote about it in Mein Kampf. He kept talking about his manifest, their manifest destiny, Lebensraum, to take over the USSR in Eastern Europe, Poland being part of that as well. And so Joseph Stalin pledged uh, you know, a mutual agreement. Let's stop hating each other over here in between Great Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union, and let's crush our, our mutual enemy to be Adolf Hitler. Let's crush Adolf Hitler together and break him before he becomes strong. But the problem is that uh, Great Britain didn't like the Soviet Union because they were a bunch of Bolsheviks and there was still a lot of bad blood there. France, same thing. Uh, the United States had not even actually recognized the Soviet Union as a country yet. They still were pretending that eventually the revolution would fail and Stalin would die and then they could have the, the czar back somehow, even though he's dead. So um, not a lot of good diplomacy going back and forth there. In fact, uh, Harry S. Truman, the future president of the United United States. He's not yet vice president right now under FDR. He was actually a senator when he heard about what was happening between Stalin and um and Hitler, and he said, I welcome a war between Stalin and Hitler. That way one can kill the other. 
Okay, and so uh, much of the world is kind of rooting for a war between these two, hoping they will destroy each other, and then we can all just sweep away the ashes of n these nasty dictators when we're done. That's not going to turn out, because now they've got that Ribbentrop-Molotov mutual non-aggression pact, and they are going to be friends with benefits, as you could say, right? They are definitely friends with benefits, as you can see. And the big question amongst people now is, how, I wonder how long the honeymoon will last. <laughs> Hmm. All right. Well, let's take a look here because remember, within one week of the uh, the Ribbentrop-Molotov mutual non-aggression pact being signed, we have World War II. So the German war machine is going to be built upon a premise um, that uh, later people will call the Blitzkrieg. Okay. The Blitzkrieg is means lightning war. All right. Blitzkrieg um, is is the terminology used to describe the German war effort here because they're so fast and it was just seen as something that was lightning quick and such an incredible surprise from what we saw in World War One, which was fought from trenches and was not a war of maneuver and movement, but this is. The Germans uh, call this thing lightning war because they're using a combination of tanks, their panzer divisions, which go out in front of their infantry, and then they've got mobile infantry, sometimes in half tracks, sometimes on motorcycles, um, often just running, you know, and so these guys are moving quickly across the field of battle, far quicker than anyone would have imagined. And then they've also got air support from their Luftwaffe. So before an attack, the Luftwaffe always flies in, usually at night, pummels the enemy with their, their Stuka dive bombers and, uh, and then blows a bunch of holes in the enemy lines. But then they also drop paratroopers behind enemy lines in order to disrupt the enemy communications. At that point, the tanks come in and they, they start destroying anything that's in their way. And then uh, the paratroopers secure the key positions so that they're uh, then able to protect their flanks. And so they just keep moving. And no one planned on that. And, and least of all, the Poles. Like, uh, there's this really beautiful story about the Poles uh, who didn't have much of a military, let's be honest. Certainly not a well-developed one. I mean, they, they really didn't have any tanks or planes, really, to speak of. Uh, but they still had cavalry, all right? God bless their cavalry. Because there's this beautiful story about as the Panzer divisions were about to cross into Poland, um, the, the Poles sent out their cavalry units on horseback and they still had the old style plumed hats with feathers and everything and they still carried their saber in one hand and their pistol in the other. Some of these cavalry units in the Polish army actually had anti-tank bazookas. Now keep in mind that um, when they were firing their anti-tank bazookas from horseback, that doesn't go very well because you fire it and you fly off your horse, right? So it doesn't ha work very well. So they actually tied themselves to their horse so that when they fired their bazookas, they were less likely to fly off this thing. That is what is facing the very modern, very deadly, very quick panzer divisions of Hitler's uh, forces here. So the panzers actually pull up and then across the field of battle you've got the, uh, the cavalry for the Poles and they just looked at each other. They looked at the tanks that were you know, blowing steam and smoke out of their engines right there, ready to attack. Everybody just kind of looked at each other for a second across the field of battle. And then what would you do in that situation? I mean, personally, I would uh, take off my hat and fire my one bazooka and run, right? I'd get the heck out of there. But instead, these glorious Poles, they drew their sabers, they fired their weapons, they rode gloriously at the panzers and died! gloriously as they were butchered to pieces. And so the attack in Poland really only took about three weeks to finish up, and the Germans crushed the Poles very speedily. Well, what this did was it brought Great Britain and France into the war. Great Britain and France will declare war on September the 3rd, thus making it a world war. And, and what Great Britain and France did is they actually waited. They waited for Germany to come at them. They expected that it would be just like the last war. So what did they do? They built up along the Maginot Line, and then they put a bunch of forces uh, behind Belgium, just like they, they had done before in World War I, thinking that Germany is going to go straight through Belgium, they're going to come at us, and then we're going to be ready for them. Well, Hitler didn't attack the way anybody expected. Instead, Hitler went to Norway. Now, why on earth would you go to Norway before going to the rest? The Norwegians are like, really? We, wh why? We, we weren't even a part of this thing. And so the reason that Hitler will go to Norway first is because after taking out this area, he will be able to effectively establish a blockade area around Great Britain and make it so that now they've got greater access into and out of the North Sea. Another thing too is it gives them another position from which to attack Great Britain through air raids. So really, Hitler is surprising 
the world by covering his flanks. A very, very smart move here. But then the next question is, what do we do about Great Britain and France? Great Britain has put a bunch of their troops right here. This is what the Germans would call a Schwerpunkt or a strong point. This is the British forces there. Then the French have got a bunch of men on the Maginot line right there. So Hitler uh, has a daunting task here and his generals are looking at him like, you know what, you screwed us because it's going to be just like World War I. Good job in Poland, Hitler, but at the same time, we're screwed here because there's no way we're going to be able to take out the same situation we saw before. So Hitler was looking for someone with an answer. And the man that gave them the answer was a man by, by the name of Erich von Manstein. And Erich von Manstein is not a Nazi. He did not like Hitler. In fact, he's going to uh, resist Hitler throughout this time period and always you know, talk smack about him. But he is one of the number one generals in the German Wehrmacht. And he came up with the plan. Rather than invading Belgium right here like we did before, because we're just going to encounter British resistance here, what we should do is take everybody by surprise. Let's not go through Belgium. Instead, let's just send a little flanking maneuver here to make them think we're going there, but let's go through the Arden Forest. The Arden Forest is seen as impregnable. It only has four roads going through it, and all of those are dirt roads. I mean, the French didn't even guard the Arden Forest because they figured there's no way an army is going to go through that. It is something that is uh, totally able to protect itself. Well, didn't go so well for the French here because basically they left, they put a bunch of uh, strong points or schwerpunks here and here, but then they left this gaping hole right there where the Germans were able to go through that in only two days. The Germans take everybody by surprise here in this invasion of France in 1940. First of all, because they waited. And secondly, because when they do go in, they break through the, the one spot where the French really had not guarded anything. The tanks are really the key to victory on this one because their tank regiments are going to be able to travel at 35 or 40 miles an hour. They'll coordinate their attacks by talking through radio technology. They can go hundreds of miles before they need to refuel. And as you heard, that's a huge difference from what the French were using at this time, which are much slower and less mobile. Um, and what the Germans will do is completely surround the enemy by forming what they called a sickle cut. All right, so the way a sickle curves around in order to slice, this is the same thing the Germans are going to do. They're going to essentially go around the French and the Brits by slicing through them in the Ardennes forest and make it so that there's no way that they're able to do anything about it. It's called an enveloping maneuver. All right, and so this is going to destroy the, Germ the French morale very, very quickly. The Germans move in so quickly that the French hadn't, I mean, they, they never saw this thing coming. In fact, uh, around 10 million people that were between Paris and the borderlands uh, with Germany and Belgium are going to flee in one of the largest refugee mass migrations in European history. Uh, this is all taking place over the course of just a couple of weeks in May and early June of 1940. The French with, had about 10 million people that took to the roads. Uh, while they were on the roads, they were getting shot to pieces by German Luftwaffe that would fly over them and shoot at them from afar and, and just targeting civilians. And many of these people, once they ran out of gas, they would, they would take whatever they could on their backs and just keep walking, basically packing up their entire homes to get away. And so Paris was basically deserted when Hitler and the Nazis showed up. Uh, a lot of plummeting morale because the, the French, you might look at them as like surrender monkeys who just gave up right away. They didn't. They lost around 150,000 people killed military men, not including the civilians here, around 150,000 men killed over the course of three weeks of fighting. And over the next three weeks, Hitler's basically just mopping up. But Hitler will pose for a couple of pictures here. Once he gets to Paris, you can see this very famous one of him standing before the Eiffel Tower. They, they offered to take him to the top of the Eiffel Tower. The, the, his German uh, attaches were with him and they were like, Mein Führer, there's an elevator that can take us to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Let's go, you don't even have to walk anymore. And he said no, because Hitler was terrified of heights. So he refused to go in the elevator. So he posed for one quick picture and then he went to Napoleon's grave. He looked down on Napoleon's grave as if to say, what you couldn't do, I will do better.
Ooh, foreshadowing, right? A little bit of dramatic irony for you. So the British Expeditionary Force, meanwhile, are stuck. Britain has not given up. In fact, there's been recently an election that took place in April of 1940, and the Prime Minister uh, is going to step down, okay? He doesn't have enough votes anymore, and the people are looking at him as a weakling, and so Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain is going to step down as Prime Minister, and instead, Winston Churchill will be appointed the next Prime Minister. So the Bulldog comes in, and, and on his first day in office, he finds out that there's roughly 350,000 British soldiers, and then thousands more French and Polish soldiers as well that are actually stuck with the British regiments on the beachheads of Dunkirk. So if you've ever seen the movie Dunkirk, it's an incredible testimony of survival, just basic survival, as these men are trying to make it as they're about to get crushed by the German tanks and Luftwaffe and Wehrmacht that are moving in. But for some reason, Hitler decides to stop his tanks and stop his Wehrmacht and tells the Luftwaffe, attack at the beachheads and we will destroy them with our planes, which spelled incredible luck for the Brits because they would have lost. They're the one democracy left standing up to Adolf Hitler. And had they not been able to resist in this moment, I mean, Europe would have fallen. Europe would have fallen right there and America never would have had a chance to invade into Europe uh, in 1944, 43 and 44 from Great Britain and Africa because Europe would have fallen at that point. So everything hinges on this one moment of whether or not Great Britain can get their army off the beach and still be able to maintain the war effort without giving up. Uh, there's a great speech, a great moment in history when uh, Winston Churchill is going to inspire his people. One of his first major speeches is to tell them that we will never surrender. Oh my gosh, wasn't that a beautiful speech? Did you get chills? Tell me you got chills. It's one of the greatest speeches in world history. I mean, there was just raucous applause for that, that they will fight from the beaches, they will fight from the streets, they will fight and will never surrender. Oh, gotta love it. Because Winston Churchill, man, myth, and legend, is going to help Great Britain to get their soldiers off the beach in a little thing called Operation Dynamo. Gets 300,000 uh, British soldiers and then a handful of Polish and French resistance soldiers as well that had not given up, get them off the beaches just before uh, France gives up their war effort. And they will do it by making every single boat that they have available. You see, uh, the naval ships were too big and there were too many mines in the seas for the naval ships to get in to rescue these men. So they had to depend on individual fishermen and, and guys with yacht, even little dinghies, you know, rowboats, had to row across the English Channel to rescue these men over the course of just one short week. And so they rescued their men. And at that point, Adolf Hitler is planning what is called the Battle of Britain. Now, fun fact, in 1940, Hitler actually discussed with his generals a little thing called Operation sea lion. Adolf Hitler was hoping to convince the uh, the Wehrmacht that they should invade into England in an in amphibious invasion. So they called it sea lion because a sea lion starts in the sea and then waddles up on shore, right? Amphibious invasion. The members of the Wehrmacht convince him that they're overstretched. There's no way that they can possibly invade into England. But that didn't mean that Germany is going to give up the attack. So what they decided to do was to use the German Luftwaffe to try and destroy England and bring England to its knees. Now, the way that they will do this is uh, what we will later call carpet bombing. Basically, the Luftwaffe is going to fly over Great Britain both during the day, but then once uh, the Brits start resisting that attack, they'll fly at night and they'll just indiscriminately bomb anything they can see, whether it's factories, bridges, um, you know, Parliament and St. Paul's Cathedral as well. Every morning, Winston Churchill is going to wake up and ask his ministers. First thing he does in the morning is he says, did they hit St. Paul's? Because over the course of six months, the Luftwaffe is going to kill 50,000 British citizens and destroy 60% of London and many other cities across England as well. Because the way that these bombs work is they have percussive bombs. So uh, as they drop these bombs, it's not just the explosion in the immediate vicinity you got to worry about, but the buildings in, in England are primarily made of brick. They're 19th century or early 20th century brick homes and buildings. And so when the repercussive effect or the reverberation from these bombs takes place, these buildings crumble. 
So children, when they would go off to school, later children will be evacuated from the cities and moved into the countryside. But children, when they are going off to school, had to wear pea coats, as they're called, or uh, jackets that had their last name sewn onto the back of their coat because frequently children would be found dead under buried rubble, uh, buried under rubble. And that was how they figured out how to, to get the kids back to their, their families. Another thing, too, is that people would frequently go into the underground or the tube, as it was called, the uh, subway tunnels. And it which was a safer place to be, but at the same time, a very dangerous place to be because often a bomb would hit right in the right spot so that it would burst pipes and burst water into those tunnels and cause everyone in those tunnels to drown, or it would cause the collapse of those tunnels right onto those people as well. The fact that they survived is absolutely amazing. This is what Winston Churchill called England's finest hour because through a combination of technology and just resistance, they were able to resist Adolf Hitler and his war machine. So technology came into play because the, the Brits uh, used radio technology and radio technology had originally been developed as a method of creating a death ray to try and shoot planes out of the sky and they realized that didn't work. So uh, they utilized radio technology to try and see um, German planes as they are coming across the skies and be able to get their planes in the skies to fight against them uh, quicker. And, and a lot of pilots died in the process. I mean, they're able to shoot down 3,000 German planes and uh, kill or capture many of their pilots, which was a huge task. But many of these pilots also died in the process. And Winston Churchill gives us a famous quote where he says, never has so much been owed by so many to so few. I'll give you that quote again. It's a very important quote. He said, never has so much been owed by so many to so few. What he meant was that the world depends on these pilots. The world depends on these radio technicians. They depended upon people in Hollywood too, who, who created these massive tarps and uh, basically a giant blanket that they could use to put on important buildings and, and factories to make it look like it was a park or make it look like it was a non-industrial target. So Winston Churchill accurately called it when he said, never has so much been owed by so many to so few because uh, if England had given up during this fight, they planned to go to Canada and to try and continue the struggle from there. They did not want to give up. And over the course of six months, they will halt the German war machine from coming into England, and it will change the course of this war forever, and thus change the course of world history forever. So now let's take a look at Hitler's next bold move. Hitler, you remember, always planned to invade the Soviet Union. He said so in his book. He talked about his Lebensraum, or living space, manifest destiny out in the East. And so the, um, the plan was to invade the Soviet Union, but Stalin didn't believe it. He didn't think it was actually going to happen. So uh, he kind of let his guard down. And, and that was, of course, because of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Mutual Non-Aggression Pact. Well, in June of 1941, Hitler launches his Operation Barbarossa which was the invasion of the USSR. Now, this uh, this attack had been delayed significantly. They, it, had they wanted to be successful, they should have attacked in, um, in like April, which was the original plan. But issues down here in Yugoslavia caused the Germans uh, to have to send units down there to fight against resistance fighters or partisan fighters down there. And it slowed the invasion, making it so that the Germans left at the end of June instead. And when they went into uh, Russia, they left with only summer clothing and only enough um, supplies to last them for about a three-month campaign. They figured if it only took us six weeks to take down France, there's no way the Russians are going to put up enough of a fight because they suck and they're untermensch and we can destroy them in no time. But they will be much surprised because as they invade into the Soviet Union, the Raputista set in a couple months earlier than planned. Raputista is a time period in uh, Russia where it gets really rainy and the roads turn to absolute muck and mire and and those super fast tanks aren't so fast when they're bogged down in mud up to a person's waist. And then the Zima will set in after that. Winter sets in. Winter was coming, and now winter is here by early October. And much like Napoleon, who invaded Russia in 1812, he underestimated the effect of the Russian winter and the Russians' ability to perform what's called a scorched earth method of burning everything to prevent the, the uh, French back then and now the, the Nazis in 1941 from um, using anything to their advantage. So the Nazis are going to be spread out. The German army here is going to be spread out across a 1,500-mile uh, front. And they are incredibly spread out to the point where there's really no way for them to be able to 
win this thing because the Soviets just keep fighting. So they're hoping to win it in a long drawn out affair and everyone's kind of waiting to see what will America do in this thing? What will America's response be as this war is going on? Because everyone knows that America could change the course of this war. Let's see the situation in America. Oh man, as you heard, uh, the Axis powers are going to form in response to the success that they've been seeing uh, over the last few years. So we're going to see what happens with Japan in our next lecture um, in, in the kinds of things they were up to throughout the 1930s and early 40s. But in response to the formation of the Axis powers and also in response to the fact that Great Britain is the last democracy left standing, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is going to prepare the first peacetime draft in American history. And with it, he's also going to create the Lend-Lease program. You see, one of the program, one of the problems that got us into World War I was the fact that we were offering loans on credit to both sides, but of course a lot more of that going to the Allies than to the Germans or the Central Powers at that time. And it was all on credit. So what FDR will do in order to appease the Brits is to offer Lend-Lease, which said, we will lend you a battleship, we will lend you tanks, we'll lend you those kinds of things, bullets, you name it, but you gotta pay in in cash and he said anybody can come and get it Britain you know of course uh, Italy Japan Germany you can come and get these things but you have to show up to our our ports and you have to pay in cash Here's the thing, only Britain has the ability to really do that and so a very smart maneuver and it's a good way to be able to keep America neutral during this time period because over 70% of Americans did not want to be a part of this war. 70% of Americans before December the 7th, 1941, did not want to be a part of this war. And Franklin Roosevelt needs to listen to that, uh, those polling numbers to keep that in mind. But of course, everything changes December the 7th, 1941. We'll take a look at how in our next video. Thanks for watching.